Now, sculpting and I have a bit of an awkward history. For five years straight, I sculpted a naked Chinese person every single day. Believe me, it, it was intense. I don't ever want to see a naked Chinese person again. <laughs> I also felt that the progress was elusive. I couldn't complain because I didn't speak the language. It actually took two years for my professor to say something to me. And the first thing he said was, Zhou Yi, which basically means, wow, Joey, your Chinese has gotten so good, but your sculpture still sucks. <laughs> this all started eight years ago when my teacher in America said, Joey, you're going to China. From America to China to now, I've come to realize that objects, sculpture, art, are essentially the same everywhere, but how we communicate, relate, and interpret them differs according to the languages we speak and the past experiences we have shared. Growing up in America, my, my sense of aesthetic was largely influenced by garage sales. I love these objects of different ages, textures, and structures. Our whole house was filled with kitsch, my mom unable to stop herself from buying a plethora of junk. When I went to China, my perception of my own art and of the art around me changed. I had to step out of my comfortable garage shell shoes and see the world in an entirely different way. In the beginning, the ceramics I made in China were mostly for prying open cracks into the culture. Clay was my gateway drug into the history of China and how its aesthetic tastes had changed over time. The first time I realized this was in Jingdezhen, the birthplace of porcelain. It's like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, except for ceramicists. A scrum diddly umptious place where everything is made of clay. When I first arrived, I started making these casts and molds of fish and frogs that I had bought at local markets. Um, I had asked a local mold maker to help me cast them, and we made about 20 different types of them. I thought that was it. Job done. Fish and frogs thrown away. Instead, later that evening, I was invited back to the factory to basically have dinner. And I walked into the canteen, and I saw all the factory workers there cooking under candlelight, cooking the fish and frogs that I had made the cast from, the ones that had sat all day in plaster. They sat me down to a feast. I had never eaten frog before, and I haven't since, but it was incredible. I had been invited in. The door had opened. One of the first large pieces of art I made in China was the China tree. Uh, I bought thousands of cheap soy sauce and vinegar pots, the, the type everyone had in their homes, the, the sweet versus the sour. At 25 cents each, they were completely disposable. Nobody cared about these objects because of the value that had been applied to them. I hired local taxi drivers and sometimes vegetable sellers to come into my studio and polish these pots, clean them and sand them. I was actively creating a relationship between the person and the object. I wanted to show them that just because these pots were cheap didn't necessarily mean they had no value. Together, using these pots, we, we grew our china tree, this massive structure of pots standing over 10 meters tall. In the beginning, the workers were breaking 15, maybe 25 pots a day. But in the end, they weren't breaking anything, not a single pot. By applying a new way of looking at a part of the world, even something so familiar to them, I gave many people a meaningful relationship with a formerly valueless object. So for me to be able to access this culture and make my projects possible, I need to know the language. As a child, I used to speak fake languages because I couldn't master the real ones. I actually didn't speak to the age of five. My brother Anderson and I would go buy sandwiches at local delis, and he would always be my translator. I would say, Vaviska voska vaska. And my brother would turn to the clerk and say, he wants mustard. So when you first encounter a new language, especially one as strange as Chinese, it can seem made up, as if the people around you are playing some well-orchestrated practical joke. And then you imagine that when they walk away, they say to themselves, oh, he totally bought it. But as you begin to learn it, uh, small cracks of light appear. Understanding filters through. However, other times, your vision becomes blurred and the meaning distorted. For example, 
Take the Chinese word for strawberry, cao mei. Now, it's actually a literal translation. Uh, cao means grass, mei means berry. Now, Chinese is a tonal language. You can say a word in four different ways, meaning each word has four different meanings. Um, when I first learned the language, um, let me tell you, it's really hard to get, get around this idea. It, it's pretty hard. And so the first time I heard strawberry in Chinese, I didn't hear the tones for grass and berry. I heard cao mei instead of cao mei. And cao mei meant fuck beauty. <laughs> fuck beauty. Oh, I love that. I remember thinking that beneath a beautiful word can be something so aesthetically distinct, testing my own understanding of the relationship between beauty and meaning, that beneath a word there can be multiple layers, depending on how we see them, say them, interpret them. Now, to me, Chinese is the valley girl language of Asia. In Cantonese and Mandarin, you have hundreds of different ways to say whatever and as if. Um, they put these final particles on the end of words to add extra emotion, like ba and la. And sometimes they put random words together to create drama, like aya, which means what a pain. I began to see and express things that I would have never done without knowing the language. And this inspired me to make work that I previously thought impossible. Like 100 Ice Children. I basically convinced Greenpeace to commissioned me to sculpt an army of 100 ice children in the hot Beijing summer heat to signify the global climate crisis and the glacier melting of the Himalayas. It was a crazy idea, really, and I had no idea how I was going to do it. But by then, I trusted Beijing to teach me how. First, I had to find ice. Uh, I couldn't freeze my own because air bubbles in it would leave these white spots. I, I needed something clear. I, I discovered that most of Beijing's ice actually comes from these man-made lakes outside the city, where in the winter they, they fill them up, freeze them, and then cut these huge ice blocks out of them and put them in these massive warehouses around the city. Just hunting for ice opened up a part of Chinese life that wasn't immediately noticeable. Once, I was asked to make a piece of glasswork for Hillary Clinton's trip to Beijing for the 09 climate change talks. I needed some place to blow glass, and I couldn't find any. Uh, after hundreds of conversations and an all-around Beijing treasure hunt, I found a place two hours outside the city. One problem. It was a Chinese glass dildo factory. So there I was, sculpting and blowing these huge hourglasses for Hillary Clinton, all the while surrounded by sex toys. And there they sat at the Beijing climate change talks on that table, these pieces of art made from recycled Chinese glass dildos. Now, if that isn't sustainable conservation, I, I don't know what is. As you can see, the whole process of my art introduced me to parts of China I would have never known. So it's not just visiting a country, but using it. Using it makes the unknown known. Through this exploration of communicating with the world around me, within my art, and within a new language, I really learned what it meant to be a malleable piece in a foreign context. China was where I began to think for myself. Because there was no precedence for what I was doing and where I was, therefore I had no expectations. And no expectations meant I could never be disappointed. Within this, I felt great freedom. Because no matter what, I was always going to be different. And I took this freedom to heart and applied it to everywhere I went and in everything I did. For example, in America, I was always shy about going to public bathrooms. I, I was piss shy, I, I admit it. But in China, I peed freely next to whomever and wherever I wanted. I was a changed peer. And in America, I would feel uncomfortable about changing in public locker rooms, uh, afraid of being judged for my lack of a muscular body. But in China, I walked naked all over the place, just, just letting it all hang out. You know, the label as a foreigner didn't push me away from the Chinese experience, but rather emboldened me in everything I did, giving me confidence in the ability to appreciate my environment and the objects that consumed it. 
So now it had reached a point in my career there that I felt now was my chance to try and influence a place that I had called so many, for so many years my home. Could I really affect China like it had affected me? Could I change people's opinions or attitudes about something that I myself was passionate about? Within all my work, there had been this developing, interweaving thread of environmentalism and community involvement. Working for environmental organizations, I soon saw the disconnect they had with their approach to messaging and their ability to motivate. They scared rather than inspired. I, I needed to find another way. The answer came to me when I was in the store in Jingdezhen, and there was this kid in front of me buying a plastic plate. Now, Jingdezhen is not a place to buy plastic. As I said, it's a whole land of clay. So I got into an argument with him. I said, Jenda Ma, like, really, dude? Are you kidding me? You walk outside this door, all you see is Taozi, porcelain, ceramic plates, and here you are buying plastic. The porcelain is five times less than the plastic. And so, I was mad. And I actually convinced him to put it back. I, I totally guilt-tripped him. Well, I realized why that kid wanted to buy plastic. Because it was special. It, it was different. It, plastic was trendy and porcelain so passé, so Ming Dynasty. It, it was this interest in the exotic that got me. That the exotic is much more appealing than the reality in front of you. So, to me, maybe China itself was my exotic. However, I could also say the ocean was too. It had recently become my escape from the Beijing smog. I had just started diving and I realized the underwater world was like going to some completely other planet, like Avatar. Floating in water is like floating in space. So I went to Indonesia to learn a technique in creating these underwater sculptures. Basically, you create a battery underwater. Uh, think of a triple-A battery. You have your negative and your positive ends. Um, underwater, it's very similar. I created it with just several feet of water in between. And it's through that water that electrons flow from the positive anode to the negative cathode. When you create these large structures underwater, you then electrocute them. And when you electrocute them, mineral accretion occurs on the cathode, the cathode being the sculpture. Um, natural dissolved minerals in seawater like magnesium hydroxide, calcium carbonate. And you basically create limestone. You, you then attach coral, and when you give coral shock therapy, it grows up to five times faster and raises the threshold of the temperature it can withstand. You, basically recreate a coral reef. You, you become an alchemist. On my way back to China, I wanted to take what I had learned back. So, I started a project called Kung Fu for Coral, a project that dealt with making saving the environment cool based around Kung Fu artists attacking global warming monsters, saving and protecting coral. You know, it's really hard to make a piece of dirt look cool. A tree as well, but coral, octopuses, that's easy. I, I tried to use coral as this gateway drug into a life of environmentalism, similar to how clay was my gateway drug into China. Uh, if I could get people interested in a place that they had never really been, then maybe I could translate that on down to their environment. I said in Kung Fu for Coral that we are the Kung Fu artists, and in a sense, the global warming monsters too. It is our own ways that need to change, and we need to fight them from within. The underwater sculptures became these conversation starters, and I used Kung Fu for Coral to reiterate the facts and promote participation. So, as you can see, art can do many things. But in the end, all art is in its core an object. Uh, but at times, we overglorify them, removing the word craft and replacing it with art. We all view certain objects differently, but as I said, in the end, they're still the same. Like, when I look at the terracotta warriors, for me, knowing that at one time they were actually covered in paint, I see a whole army of drag queens. Uh, the resemblance is quite shocking. Or when I'm in Jingdezhen, and when I see these porcelain statues of Mao in Jingdezhen and that type of smooth, brown, matte glaze, 
I actually see RuPaul. But nonetheless, they are just sculpted pieces of clay set in stone. China for me was a world defined and constrained by lines I felt at times I could not cross. Lines that for me dealt mostly with racial identity. For China is a country so tied to its race, tied to what you look like rather than who you are from within. Maybe these lines were there to protect me, but at times I often felt they imprisoned me. I had to face the fact that whatever I did, I could never cross that line and become Chinese. But then I realized something, that maybe it's not about crossing the line, but about staying on the line, that, that area in between being an outsider and being an insider, an area where you can look objectively at two cultures while creating one of your own as well. So let me end and say that even though my experiences have come from immersing myself in a new world by crossing continents, you don't need to go to China to put yourself in a foreign world and see what comes out of it. Even within our own towns and the boundaries of our own countries, you can see people doing different things in different contexts. Take yourself out of the equation and see yourself as a foreigner a complete weirdo. Truly never fitting in is a good thing. Uh, you can learn to be exactly who you are without concern for what others think. You can pee freely. But most importantly, you become a different person and therefore a richer being. Thank you.